It was a small fob on the uh, Jordan-Iraq border, middle of nowhere, as far west as you can go. Our incident was the first combat interaction that we had had. It was mounted patrol in a vehicle. I was uh, driving a Humvee. It was a roadside bomb. When it happened, I continued to drive for about 100 to 150 meters. Engine was knocked out. All four tires were flat. You know, I lost an exorbitant amount of blood. I knew it was bad, real bad. Things still come back to me, even though it's been 17 years. And it's crazy how, you know, things can come back after that long. You're supposed to turn into the blast, help the engine take all of the shrapnel. It didn't take all of it. There was pieces that got my right arm, hit me in the head, and then got everybody else in the vehicle. The vehicle was in front of me. He had already turned around, and he had made it back, and he was the one that pulled me out of my vehicle. They lay you on the ground, most critical, the least critical. The time of explosion to the time that the medevac got on the ground. <clears throat> That's about a half an hour. I got in the air and I kept getting my feet loose. My body kept tensing up, you know, and uh, they said, you know, if you keep doing that, we're gonna have to physically restrain you. When I got the first call, it was almost like an out of body experience. Something happened with Tim and I just started screaming. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know if he was dead or alive. I didn't know where he was. You know, I didn't know the severity. I knew I was bad. I didn't know how bad. I woke up two days later in Launchstuhl, Germany. When they woke me up in Germany, my mom had called me. That's when they took the breathing tube out. I'm making the phone call, and I'm talking to the nurse, and she goes, well, do you want to talk to him? Well, yeah. <laughs> and she goes, but you can't cry. And that was probably the hardest thing. And he answers the phone, and actually it's funny, because he goes, I got blown up. <laughs> he goes, I ain't got no arm. And then he says, um, but I'm fighting. And so that was it. I mean, that phone call was the one that said, okay, he's okay. He's, he's here, he's okay. I didn't know what to think, you know, I knew I'd lost my arm. It's a weird feeling, you know. It, it's like, well, now what? And all of a sudden you go from being, you know, doing what you're doing, being fine, and then you're laying in a hospital bed. I wasn't bedridden, but they didn't want me up moving around by myself. Everything that you thought you were going to be able to do, it's like, well, can I? Well, now everyday life, folding clothes or, you know, making a bed. And the initial response was you're almost speechless, you know, because there's so many things going through your head. They flew me to uh, Andrews Air Force Base and then transferred me from Andrews to Bethesda National Naval Medical Center. My whole family was there. <clears throat> my dad and mom played a huge part in my recovery. You know, they were there helping, helping me out and uh, <clears throat> getting through. It was shocking. I mean, he was tore up. Of course, his arm is bandaged. Just being there and seeing him was the best thing. I got the prosthetic implanted because I had a craniotomy done. I got the prosthetic placed. I was there for two weeks, and then they transferred me to Walter Reed for a week as an inpatient, and then my rest of my time was outpatient. I had an occupational therapist. Her name was Christy. Pretty much worked with her every day for about 10 months where they teach you, you know, how to use your prosthetic, whether it be an arm or a leg. Helping him, but not helping him because they didn't want you to help him too much because he had to learn to work with one arm. There were times that and it was kind of rough, you know, getting frustrated, not being able to use the prosthetic, right? His attitude was so positive for what he'd gone through. See, everybody has days, but uh, it wasn't as bad on me as it probably could have been or could be with other guys. And knowing that he was gonna be okay, and there were some of them there that weren't, we met a lot of families that were in the same position. Everybody's there trying to do the same thing, you know, recover. 
Some people go and get back to their, you know, units. Some, you know, like myself or, you know, they retire. They released me to go back to Camp Lejeune and that's when I got uh, medically discharged. JCS was mentioned to me through a caseworker. She had asked if it was okay if Matt had contacted me and I said, yeah, you know, he called and I talked to him for a little bit and uh, whenever he said JCS is just trying to give back to, not forgotten about, but former service members that are okay, they moved on, so many people want to give and don't know how to do it, JCS is there to connect the two. Then or whenever I first met all the guys, I mean, it was, for me, laid back. The guys were real easygoing, you know, funny, just kind of hanging out, you know, which that makes it easier, you know, to open up. My hopes of being part of the JCS family is the, the camaraderie, you know, like having a group of people to kind of lean on. If I'm having a bad day, you know, I can, I can call, you know. And more importantly is if they need to lean on somebody, phone calls, texts, you know, hey, I'm not having a good day, things like that. That would be hugely beneficial for me, you know, if I can help out somebody else. Hearing him say that he wants to be there for others, really, I'm, I'm really proud because then that will help him too. There's too many people that, you know, give up and you never want to get that phone call. Oh, your friend, now what, you know? But I, if I can give back to somebody that is not having a good day too, you know, that means the world.